Hello everyone, I'm Delaney Howell, host for this video series with Successful Farming, one of the world's largest and leading news agricultural organizations. I want to welcome you here to the first installment of the Corteva AgriScience Presents. On these episodes, we'll be bringing you conversations with senior leaders at Corteva about timely issues and topics impacting global agriculture, farmer and consumer well-being, and the sustainability of the world's largest and most important industry. Today, we're delighted to be inaugurating this program with a very familiar face, the gentleman at the helm of Corteva, its CEO, Jim Collins, along with farmer Gene Baumgartner, an Ohio farmer and Corteva customer. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. Thank you. Great to be here with you, Delaney. And Gene, great to, great to see you. So Jim, I want to start it out here with a question for you because you've been at the company for a, a few years now and you know you just took over a 16 billion dollar startup company. Hard to believe we're using that terminology, but can you walk us through the origins of Corteva for those that may not be familiar with it? Yeah, sure, sure Delaney, thanks. Um, you know, this all started back in December of 2015 where we announced our intent to create a merger of equals between the Dow and the DuPont Corporation, two you know, iconic leader enterprises uh, that had over probably 300 years of combined history in the, uh, in the agriculture space, uh, very steeped in science and, and innovation uh, and a very strong uh, set of, of, of values. Now that merger was actually finalized in August of 2017 after we worked our way through all the regulatory approvals that were required. Uh, and then soon after that merger, we immediately began the process of standing up to separate three uh, new companies and one of those uh, being Corteva AgriScience. So now we officially came to life in June um, a year ago, 2019, when we opened the bell on Wall Street and we went to market as a $14 billion sales company uh, with, with presence and employees in over 140 countries um, around the world, some 20,000 employees, over 150 R&D facilities already established and, and up and running. So instantly, a Fortune 200 company uh, was born. And with all of that history that I talked about, coupled with the excitement of day one, I like to call ourselves a 300-year-old startup, so it's a, it's a good way to describe it. Most importantly, through all of that, we worked really hard to set out to build a new type of, of ag company, one that was very focused on putting farmers' livelihoods and consumers' preferences at the very center of our business, the center of our operating models. We made that the focus of our research. Uh, we put sustainability in, in, into what we do. Um, and our, our focus on, on creating value for our shareholders. So, you know, it's been a pretty exciting five-year journey uh, from the inception all the way now to execution. Uh, and I got to tell you, um, I, I feel really lucky to be leading such an amazing team. Absolutely. You guys have a great history. And Gene, I'm sure you also have a great history on your farm. Tell us a little bit about your operation and how things have been changing for you. Well, we farm uh, in Southwest Ohio, uh, a little town called Jeffersonville. Um, we're about 40 miles out uh, outside Southwest of Columbus. We farm about 2000 acres of our own ground and then another 700 for uh, a local dairy. And um, the history of our farm, uh, I went to work for my father-in-law 40 years ago. And uh, uh, he was the base, he was the, the uh, innovator that started this whole thing. And uh, while the family had been on a small farm for uh, five generations, uh, he really brought it uh, into the modern age. So uh, uh, that's how we happen to be called Ricketts Farm Incorporated in, in his memory. Uh, as far as changes uh, over the last few years, uh, you know, it's farming. Um, our, our sort of our mantra is that uh, we can have a plan at eight o'clock and 805 it changes. Um, the, the, uh, the weather, the uh, economics, the technologies um, have been a uh, whirlwind of change in the last five to 10 years. So it's, 
it's been a challenge. Uh, and COVID is just another bump in the road. <laughs> Absolutely, Jim. I'm sure you would agree too that there at Corteva, you might have a plan, but that doesn't always uh, necessarily follow through. How have you guys been transitioning and dealing with all of this going on globally with COVID-19? Uh, we've kept those, those uh, collective needs of our farmers and ranchers at the forefront of everything we do. Um, I've certainly worked really hard to make sure our, our people were safe um, and productive. Uh, and like I said before, I'm just so privileged to lead an organization that has been so committed and so resilient through all of this. It just amazes me every day. Uh, and we, we are doing it for the benefit of, of, of all of our uh, stakeholders. So. And Jim, considering all of these things going on right now, what have been your priorities for the business to work through these challenging times? You know, it's been a, an interesting year. We, we started prior to the onset of COVID. We, we had a fantastic year um, underway. So we had a, a, a real position of strength. Um, and that momentum kind of carried us in into the first quarter. But, you know, then the, then the pandemic hit. And so we quickly had to reprioritize a business that was only really three months, uh, three months into the year. And uh, I created a real simple kind of five phase approach. You know, fa phase one was first focus on employees, uh, take care of them, get them into their new work environments, get them safe, get them com comfortable with managing uh, through all of this and, and just get them stable. So they were ready to continue uh, to operate uh, and drive the business and also they were able to take care of their families who were going through the, you know this whole transition. Um, phase two was all about customers, taking care of our customers to ensure that they could continue to operate. Um, and we had an ag season that was underway in the northern hemisphere. So maintaining that business continuity and getting seed and crop protection products shipped was more important uh, than ever. Uh, and, and then we pivoted to a phase three was about cash. If there's one thing I remember during the financial crisis, the the 0809 financial crisis is companies didn't move quickly enough to preserve cash. So you have to do it quickly. It's essential for any business to find and preserve cash in a time when borrowing and collections could be really difficult. So, uh, so time was really critical there and, and our team, I think, did a fantastic job. Um, and then it was set a revised plan for the remainder of the year. You know, create a new operating plan to address these new um, dynamics that, that are unfolding here o over this medium term. Uh, and then finally, and we're kind of in this phase right now of saying, okay, what does restart and recovery um, look like? And it's about evaluating how we want to work in the future. Uh, we're, uh, we're excited about how this pandemic might have actually changed the way we work for, for, for good and, and for better. Uh, going forward. So a uh, very simple five-phase approach really helped the, organize, uh, the organization focus. Uh, and all that being said, through this incredibly disruptive time, we're seeing continued growth in our core markets, both in seed and, and crop protection. And uh, I know we'll talk a little bit about our, our R&D lineup. I, I think it's one of the best lineups uh, that I've seen in my time uh, in agriculture, both in seed and chemistry. So, uh, it, you know, it's that connection to our customers, the, that unique route to market, that, that high-touch service that we offer that I think really shines in times like these. Now, Gene, I don't know if you mentioned this earlier, but is it just you on your farm? And if it's not just you, you have a team of people working with you, how have you been adjusting to maybe health cautions or keeping your folks happy and healthy during COVID-19? We try to, to follow the uh, governor's orders here in the state of Ohio and, and um Ohio's been very lucky. Uh, I think our government officials have done a relatively good job of uh, keeping us, number one, informed of, of, about what has been going on and, and providing guidance that has kept a lot of people healthy. Yeah, and I think the thing about this pandemic is it's put a spotlight on a lot of different issues, including safety, but also global food security. Jim, what has Corteva learned in terms of global food security, and what have we learned as an industry about the vulnerabilities associated with pandemics of this nature? Yeah, you know, Delaney, I, I would uh, argue that even before the pandemic, global food security was one of the more pressing issues uh, of our time, as you, uh, as you mentioned. You know, in a world that's projected to grow to 9 billion people by 2050, and it's stressed by urbanization and climate change and dietary needs, and certainly Mother Nature keeps things interesting with, uh, with pest and disease encroachment. Uh, and we know we've got a finite set of resources. 
uh, we knew that the status quo wasn't going to cut it in terms of food production, hence all, all of the new uh, tools and, and technology that, that Gene mentioned that, that we've been uh, driving hard. But I do agree with you, this pandemic has had a, uh, added a whole new layer of stress o over the top of, of all of that. I, I, was, um, I was reading the other day um, uh, some information from the World Bank that said the uh, pandemic's economic impact could push an additional 100 million more people uh, into extreme poverty around the world. And that, that, that means you know, their inability to afford you know, the basic, basic needs so to avert an emergency that I, I believe, you know, we've got to work hard and urgently to protect the most vulnerable uh, folks that like I just mentioned uh, and keep those global food supply chains alive. And then as this pandemic kind of hopefully winds down here, uh, we need to invest in building back a better and an even more resilient uh, food system. And so uh, what, I, what I like about that, it's, it really is tied to the fundamental mission of, of, of Corteva, right? Why we establish this, this new enterprise. Uh, we see those great challenges, but we know we've got tools and technology that can turn those challenges into, into opportunities uh, and really work hard to you know, bring, bring us along towards that goal of, of enriching lives. Absolutely. And you mentioned, you know, on a global scale that it sounds like a lot of folks are going to have some challenges here. But what are you hearing on a more rural or, or local scale from ranchers and farmers? You know, we, we do spend a lot of time every single day around the world uh, listening to, to, to farmers, their needs and their concerns. And uh, I, they tell us a, a very consistent story. You know, first, there, there's, there's concerns about the economics and the profitability uh, in, in agriculture. Uh, clearly, they're, they're watching trade uh, tensions and understanding the flow of, of, of goods and services around the world, especially commodity grains. Um, they're, they're worried about actually bearing the brunt of many of the costs that are associated with us establishing new processes, new routines, even, uh, even new regulations. Uh, many of them are concerned about their children's future uh, and the future of, of their family farm. Uh, and as we talk to them about uh, uh, the products that we offer, they certainly want better, but they want simpler solutions. They, they don't need any more complexity and with all the other things uh, that, that I just uh, mentioned. However, I find they are very open to new ideas. They see the benefits of new technology, uh, technologies that can help produce more and better and nutritious and plentiful food. Um, and they understand that consumers' expectations about food and ag are, are changing. Uh, and at the end of the day, they, they worry that they, they may lack the resources to stay ahead of all of those changes. So it's why we're using all of these insights to inform our R&D efforts. Uh, we, uh, we use it to help drive our advocacy efforts, you know, getting connected to governments and, uh, and, and working to, to be an advocate for growers. Um, it helps to shape our product pipeline priorities, uh, and it's certainly driving our sustainability um, work. Uh, the, the key areas around uh, things like social impact uh, and, and how we go to market and how we can be a part of, of, of the solution. So, so as one of the world's largest pure play ag companies, we do feel a pretty deep responsibility to take a leadership position here in advocating and not only just advocating, taking action uh, on some of these global food security issues. And Gina, Jim just mentioned there that, you know, farmers are looking for new technologies, they're looking for resources, and you, you, as a farmer, you're looking for partners. How do you go about sorting through different partners and, you know, especially your relationship with Corteva, how, what do you look for in those businesses that you work with? You know, on our farm, we expect to do the best we can. And as we, we look at business partners, we look for the best. Now, it's not only their, their technology, but um, their dealings with pus, uh, customers and, and with their own employees, how, how they, they, get, they work together. And that's, uh, for me, that's pretty important. Um, our biggest concern, our biggest challenge right now is sorting out all the new technologies. Um, which ones will work on our farms? which one are a waste of money. And, and the difficult part, I think, for companies like Corteva is that it's a not a one-size-fits-all fit, world. And uh, 
providing those things that work best in different regions or in um, even farm to farm is, is a is a difficult task. And then uh, it, it's it's a challenge. It's just an all around challenge. It certainly is. I think a lot of farmers would agree with you there. And I really like what you mentioned about the one size fits all model. I think a lot of farmers resonate with that point. Jim, going off of that a little bit, you know, this one size fits all model doesn't work for everyone. There's a lot going on right now with a pandemic and we've seen a lot of farmers switch gears quickly, maybe doing working with consumers directly, but you know, ultimately the pandemic has brought a lot of craziness. It's brought a lot of issues or maybe things have come to the forefront with trade and otherwise. How do you think that global trade and the supply landscape will change post pandemic or maybe how should it change? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, as a as a lar as a global company, we move a lot of material uh, around the world, and we acquire a number of different inputs. So, on the supply chain side, there's been a tremendous amount of learning that's taken place over over these last uh, few months. Now, at Corteva, we were fortunate to have that global scale, uh, but you think about the seed business also. We're very local from a production perspective. Um, our distribution and our sales models are really tailored for those specific markets, the, the growing conditions, e even the economic conditions. So uh, when we're in 140 countries with folks on the ground, um, we're working directly with farmers and distributors and, and retailers. So uh, we've had to put in new safety protocols um, to make sure we're keeping our people uh, safe uh, and, and our customers uh, safe as well. And then I think about the output side, grain production and global trade. And um, you know, clearly we've seen a number of disruptions through all of that. We're, we're very encouraged by the recent passage of the USMCA uh, trade deal. And, and certainly all indications are China is living to its phase one uh, trade commitments uh, as well. So you know, we're gonna continue to be an advocate uh, for, for, for growers uh, and, and to work on things like trade agreements and, and other areas that are gonna be so important for, uh, for their livelihoods going forward. You certainly keep busy, Jim, because not only do you advocate on a national scale, you also advocate on a domestic scale for our U.S. farmers and folks. And so I'm very interested to hear more about this, but you've been working with the White House, it sounds like, and other businesses and government leaders to help create an economic recovery plan, you know, as we continue to deal with COVID-19 and trade disputes and all of that stuff. Can you tell us a little bit more about your participation and what's being done on that front? Yeah, it was, uh, it was really interesting. I, I was fortunate to participate uh, in, in the White House call on economic recovery. Uh, we had about 24 hours uh, notice that we were gonna be invited uh, to, this, uh, to this meeting. And, um, and I shared Corteva's views on actions that the US administration uh, should take to really support our, our growers. You know, first, I stress that it's critical that the United States keep ag labeled as essential, an essential industry uh, it protected farmers' interests and assured that we could continue to deliver the really important inputs like seed and, and crop protection. We really ran the risk of these states really closing down. And so with that essential designation, we were able to get out there and ensure the resilience of our supply chains that we were able to meet um, our, our customers' needs for input because it happened right at that critical planting stage uh, here in this, uh, in this 2020 season. Uh, so I was really pleased that our input was, was asked for uh, and our input was taken uh, and we started to see it as the administration shifted their policies. Well, one area that we mentioned was walling off the small business loans process so that farmers had access to uh, a piece of that for their operations. Uh, certainly advocating for the market facilitation payments or the MF, MFP payments that USDA has, has been so uh, uh, for, forthright in bringing. And then one of the things Secretary Purdue and I talked about specifically was uh, how do we help farmers connect directly to local food banks? There, there were so many examples of where growers were still producing, dairies were still producing, but, but access to those vital end markets ha had really stopped. And so we were just wasting so much of that input. So through uh, the USDA food box program, uh, we were able to create a bridge between producers and, uh, and critical folks uh, on the consumer side. So. Um, I've had great conversations with the Secretary and other members of the Department of Agriculture as well. Um, our team uh, has a, a strong ground game and stays in close contact with many members of Congress. Uh, I, uh, I get to know as many of the ag, state ag commissioners uh, and state secretaries of agriculture that, that I possibly can. So 
I think it's just another extremely important part uh, of, of what we do as a company is provide input uh, and, and uh, our voice to help support our, our customers and, uh, and just to let the administration know, you know, we're, we're, we're there to make sure that, uh, that, that we're passing those critical needs on. Gene, I don't know about you, but sometimes I wish I could have access to tap politicians like that and, and share ideas and opinions. But, you know, from your perspective, you mentioned that you've been trying to abide by and work with the Ohio government uh, to make sure that your farm standards are in place for during COVID-19. But do you feel like as a whole, industry leaders and the government are supporting farmers? And if, you know, if you wish there were changes, what changes would you wish to see? I think agriculture needs a bit of a helping hand from the from the government to make sure that 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 we are farming sustainably that we are doing what we need to do we have seen a rollback in a lot of regulations that that have uh, hindered farmers and that's been a good thing and the freedom to farm the 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 license to farm is is uh, important to the whole industry Absolutely. And I'm glad you mentioned sustainability because that's, you know, been a buzzword now for a few years in agriculture. And it's one I don't think that's going to go away, especially as more consumers are interested to learn about what we're doing on the farm. But Jim, I know that you guys at Corteva have announced some new global sustainability goals and targets and programs. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, we, yes, we, we did. So, you know, if you go back to our purpose statement uh, that we talked about in the beginning about thinking about generations to come, uh, and doing so by helping farmers succeed uh, today. That means keeping our environment and our natural resources healthy uh, for that future, uh, as, uh, as Gene mentioned. So um, I, I've been aware of this for a long time, that there are no better stewards of our land than, than farmers. Um, and so sustainability and agriculture are inextricably linked. And, and of course, you know, we've seen this up close this year. You know, we've seen uh, the, what we believe the impacts of, of climate change are and extraordinary weather events, the, the windstorms that went across the, the, the Midwest, some of the flooding and, uh, and the horrible fires uh, that, we're, that we're seeing out west. So back on June 1st, our, our one year anniversary, uh, we used that as an opportunity to announce our Enriching Lives Together sustainability strategy. And uh, you know, I, I think it's a, a fantastic set of 14 specific goals all of which were inspired by our conversations with, with farmers and consumers and, and policymakers, but all of them are focused on bettering the lives of farmers, focused on protecting our land and natural resources, focused on improving um, our communities, uh, and then certainly benefiting uh, our own specific uh, operations. So uh, we set our sights high uh, on what we hope to achieve over the next 10 years by working in a partnership with, with, with all of those constituencies. Uh, uh, goals like increasing crop yields by, by 20%, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 20%. Uh, as Gene mentioned, soil health. So enhancing soil health on nearly 75 million acres you know, of, of land uh, or improving biodiversity. We hear a lot about that today uh, on over 25 million acres. And the list goes on and on. I, you know, I, I encourage folks to go to our website and, uh, and, and you can see those goals in, in more detail. Now we're just getting started, but we're very encouraged by what we can accomplish uh, with, with our industry partners and certainly working uh, directly with our customers. Um, all of us working together to build on this extraordinary business uh, and way of life that we uh, that we love and know is agriculture. So we're we're excited to get get that get that ball rolling. Absolutely. And Gene, you know, being a steward of the land, that's that's a tall order to fill. I think you know that you are taking care of the land and making sure that it's available to have resources for generations to come. When you look at new practices that are out there right now, what has you really fired up about technology or practices in agriculture? And have you adopted any that have shown maybe a good promise in terms of improving your production or health of your land? Uh, yeah, we, we have made, you know, over the, over the years, we've made a lot of changes. We plant cover crops. We plant conservation cover. And I like to make a distinction there. We have the, since we work with the dairy, we have the opportunity to plant fall crops, harvest them in the spring that have protected our soil, that have had it uh, added organic matter that have kept the 
uh, the biological engine running over the cold months of the year. And, and uh, uh, we have something to sell to a uh, forage crop to sell to the dairy. Um, cover crops is wheat for us. Uh, again, it's it, but we take it to full term as far as uh, uh, producing the grain. So our goal is to have every acre uh, covered with green uh, at least 11 months out of the year. So um, it has, uh, we've gone to more no-till. Uh, working with the dairy, we're, um, we have, just for us, we have 250 acres that, uh, that we chop for corn silage. And uh, this fall, we'll plant it to triticale. Uh, next spring, we'll chop it for um, haylage and then plant it to soybeans. There, there will, will have been choppers and semis and heavy trucks uh, over that ground twice in a year. And we haven't taken a chisel plow to the field in 10 years. And, um, uh, you know, it's not everybody has that opportunity, but to me, it points up the uh, importance of, of um, expanding our diversity in, in our uh, cropping systems, um, using cover crops when you can, uh, or conservation cover when you can. I know it has uh, cut our fertilizer bills to an extent. And um, I also know that we do not have the runoff or uh, our movement of nutrients that we would have in a conventional system. Wow, you guys are doing a lot of really sustainable measures. I mean, I'm very impressed. That's really neat. Thank you. We try. <laughs> Jim, when you look at R&D coming down the pipeline here, what practices or technologies or things have you really excited and fired up? Yeah, ma many of the, the same things that, uh, that Jean just talked about, you know, this, uh, this focus on soil health, uh, and, and the focus on rotational cropping uh, to, to, you know, if, if you think about a farm as a 365-day operation and, and that, that biological engine that Gene mentioned is, uh, is a great way to look at it. What, what can we do to feed that engine and keep it healthy uh, over time? So, you know, we're, we're committed to, to delivering innovation uh, to the market that helps customers uh, do just that, re really strengthen their business. Uh, and, um, and, and certainly can, can help us as a company from a, uh, from a growth perspective, uh, an investment perspective. So, you know, I like to think about uh, every time a, a, a grower buys one of our products, you know, they're voting with their dollars uh, and we take a portion of those dollars and reinvest it back into the future. So, you know, since the Dow DuPont merger, um, we've launched 14 innovative new products into the marketplace. And, I think one of the best examples of that is the Enlist E3 uh, system. Uh, it's an innovative product that allows farmers the flexibility with three modes of action to manage uh, those tough to control uh, herbicide resistant weeds. When we combine that herbicide tolerance capability with some of the best background genetics and add to that seed applied technology uh, and then put a, put a service offering on, on, on top of that, uh, we think we can provide just an incredibly complete package now, especially if you're growing soybeans uh, in, the, in the Midwest. Um, another really great example that we launched last year uh, has been Chrome. Uh, Chrome branded corn hybrids feature a, a really novel molecular stack of multiple insect protection traits uh, that gives us two modes of, of action on board to control uh, the corn rootworm. And um, we continue to see this product doing really well. That new trait is six to 10 bushels uh, per acre yield advantage over the legacy triple stacks uh, that have been there in that market. So, uh, and then one final example, um, we, we don't grow a lot of canola here in the US, but uh, we have an optimum Gly canola that will be coming, uh, launching in Canada in, in the coming months. So very excited uh, about having access to this new technology. They will finally have choices now to really control uh, some of the tougher weeds that, that are showing up in the canola crop. So a couple of examples. Gene, I don't know how you keep up on all of these new technologies. I mean, you know, Jim just listed quite a few with Enlist and Chrome, and then you look on the equipment side of things with 
autonomy and things you can do from your smartphone and iPad. How do you keep up with all of these rapid technological changes and how do you manage it? I, I mentioned that one of my employees has employees. Well, uh, several years ago, I, I hired a college graduate in technology management from Ohio State University. And, and I said, you know, uh, you're going to earn farm wages, but here's an opportunity for you to build a business too. And uh, it has worked out very well. I have an, uh, an on-site technology expert, and it's been very valuable. Yeah, and not only that, you know, but there are just so many things coming at you all the time with changes in technology, changes in commodity prices and trade and otherwise. How do you think or what do you think the keys are going to be to keeping your farming business thriving here over the next five to 10 years? And what changes do you anticipate? I know that's a hard question to ask, you know, thinking um, about you haul it, you, you hired a, a person on your staff just to focus on technology. Well, I, I often tell people that I am a farmer, but definition of farmer should be risk manager. And, um, you know, for me, uh, it's managing those risks, whether it's health, whether it's economic, whether it's technological, those are the things. And it's just uh, working at keeping up. As, as someone in some businesses would say, that's what I get paid the big bucks for. So it's complicated. It's also uh, job security. And I think part of job security is being able to adapt and change and manage that risk. And switching tracks here just a little bit, Jim, one of those new things that has emerged here recently on the marketplace has been plant-based meats or alternative meat solutions. And I think that that scares some farmers to think that, you know, especially livestock farmers, there's a product that can directly compete with them. But where do you see this going and how does Corteva fit into that mold? You know, the way I think about it, it's, it's all about choice. And Corteva works hard to provide the right choices to farmers to grow crops that enable food companies to provide choices to their consumers. Uh, and so we're going to continue, as we always have, to watch those markets and consumer preferences to understand how we can translate that back and how we can best help our growers. And we will continue to keep an open dialogue with the food industry organizations, along with our own research to help us understand what is today's consumer asking uh, of the food industry um, going forward. So, so we can be ahead of it, right? We can kind of create those innovative solutions uh, that, that, that can help meet those demands, whatever they are, whatever those choices are. And what would you echo to farmers or what would you share with farmers that are dealing with pain points, dealing with new markets, new technologies, new substitutes to their products? How do you respond? Yeah, I, I think Gene used the perfect word. Um, it's partnership. Um, farmers have a partner in Corteva. And we're working around the clock to, to bring them solutions, not just products, not, not just, just one-off bits and pieces. You heard Gene mention a number of different uh, product areas. Um, we actually have those kind of folks on the ground, uh, giving counsel, uh, sitting down with growers uh, every day. And then we're going to be their partner on the um, national and state level from an economic and, and a market opportunity, whether it's trade issues, whether it's economic relief uh, during, the, uh, during the pandemic. Um, and then we're global, so we're going to leverage the best knowledge that we have in other parts of the world to make sure you know, farmers like Gene are plugged in to new trends and developments that are going on in Brazil or, or things that are, are happening in Europe or in Asia. Know that our partnership kind of spans the globe and it spans consumers uh, to, uh, to producers. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're all in this together. We're, we're going to get through it together and we're going we're, we're to manage it uh, together. But that's because, you know, we got to think of ourselves as, as partners in this value chain, in this supply chain. What can Corteva do or what does Corteva do and, and how can agriculture as a whole do a better job to create more social justice and inclusion and also more focus on issues like mental health and all these issues that continue to dominate the agenda? Yes, I, I believe the ag industry has a, a huge role uh, to play here, whether it's, uh, whether it's on the farm, whether it's in our laboratories, whether it's across that entire food value chain. We, we need everyone's contribution to, to get at these um, issues. 
Uh, I've been very clear to my organization that there is absolutely no room for exclusion, prejudice, or social injustice of any kind. And so for us at, at Corteva, having a workforce that is inclusive is the only way we see ourselves being able to do business the, the right way in, in this world that's uh, so dynamic and so multifaceted and, and obviously, as we've talked here today, uh, just rapidly evolving. Wow, I, I mean, I think that was a good good tie on that there, Jim, but you guys both have shared some fantastic insight today. Thank you so much for being part of this inaugural first installment. There's a lot to reflect on as we go back and, and think about all that you both have mentioned. And there's gonna be a lot going on here to sail these uncharted waters for the near future and potentially longer. But at Successful Farming and Meredith Agrimedia, we'll always do our best to keep you abreast of all these changes and their impact on agriculture. We'll be back soon with another installment of Corteva Presents. Until then, stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you soon.